Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and we start with rural affairs, land reform, and islands. I'd invite members wishing to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak button during the relevant question. Members will be aware now of the new time limits, which will be rigorously uh, applied, so brevity in questions and responses would be welcome. And I call question number one, Christine Graham. Test case. To ask the Scottish Government how the measures in its programme for government 2023-24 will support the rural economy in Midlothian South, Tweeddale and Lauderdale constituency. Cabinet Secretary. All Scotland-wide commitments in our ambitious PFG contribute to our rural economy and there are a range of commitments within that that relate specifically to rural industries, supporting jobs and businesses in constituencies like Christine Graham's. And these include paying Scottish farmers and crofters £550 million of payments beginning this month, investing £1 million in skills development for woodland creation and in nature and peatland restoration. And businesses and communities in the Midlothian, Tweeddale and Lauderdale area will also benefit from our PFG commitment to support the the ambitions of the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city region to develop and implement their regional economic prosperity framework. Christine Graham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for answer. Yesterday, of course, highlighted, yesterday's debate highlighted the contribution of our farming sector to our economy. Can I ask, given that uh, many farmers are not as young as they used to be, what support is being given to encourage young people into the sector? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be able to update Parliament this afternoon that, as promised in this year's programme for government, we've now started making our payments to farmers and crofters. Two weeks ahead of schedule, initial payments worth approximately £288 million are now being paid into over 13,000 businesses all across Scotland, including in Christine Graham's constituency. And unlike in England, we're ensuring that stability by maintaining direct payments. And in the coming year, we'll be paying Scottish farmers and crofters £550 million to support actions to produce food. But Christine Graham also rightly mentions and importantly mentions new entrants to the industry as well. And that's why we have another commitment within our programme for government that commits us to working with them to develop new support for new entrants going forward. Question two, Donald Cameron. Could we have Mr Cameron's microphone? Could you perhaps take your card out and reinsert it please, Mr Cameron? Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I refer to my register of interests, uh, both in terms of crofting and the fact that I'm a member of the Faculty of Advocates, to ask the Scottish Government for what reason its programme for government 2023 to 2024 did not include a commitment to a crofting bill? Cabinet Secretary. The programme for government 2023 to 24 commits the Scottish Government to developing and consulting on proposals to reform crofting law. Now, that is a key and necessary part of the process to develop and then introduce a bill, and we remain committed to doing so in this parliamentary term. Don Cameron. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that crofting reform of some sort has been pledged by this government in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2022, and now in 2023. And yet in that time, there has been little movement despite calls for reform from crofting communities. What assurances can she give these communities that the most recent pledge won't end up in the long grass like the many pledges that have gone before it? Cabinet Secretary. 
I would disagree with the member because we committed to introducing a crofting bill this parliamentary term and that is exactly what we've set out to do. And in order to do that and consider the proposals that have been brought forward previously, we reintroduced and re-established the crofting bill group and that has met 11 times so far with further meetings planned so that we can further develop those proposals. As I set out in my initial response, there is a process we have to go through in developing legislation. That's why we've committed to introducing a consultation on the measures that we will be bringing forward for a bill. And briefly, Alistair Allen. Uh, I look forward to seeing the, the bill uh, that the Minister has confirmed. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me, however, that it is quite difficult with respect for opposition parties to cast themselves as champions for crofting while they are content by their silence to allow their colleagues at Westminster to leave crofters totally in the dark over the future of LFAS funding? Cabinet Secretary. I, yes, I would agree with that because the imposed Brexit that we've had forced on us in Scotland means that rural Scotland in particular has been badly let down because Elfast or the funding to support those who need it most, farming and crofting in the most marginal areas that we have in Scotland, might not matter to the UK government because after all it chose in the last cap not to provide that funding in England but with over 80% of all land in Scotland being in less favourable areas it really does matter to us and particularly to our crofters as well. Now, multi-year certainty has been replaced with absolutely no commitment for funding beyond 2025, and that is as a result of the choices that were made by the UK government and its refusal to deliver on its own public commitment to engage meaningfully on future budgets. Briefly, Rhoda Grant. The, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that a crofting bill was promised in the last Parliament. The problems with crofting was caused by the previous bill and we desperately need a bill to put right what was done wrong in that bill. So will she either repeal the previous bill or come forward immediately with a new bill because this is a dead hand on crofting? Government Secretary, briefly as possible. All of the issues that the member has highlighted and that have been raised previously are being considered by the Crofting Bill Group. And again, it is our intention to provide that clarity in law to tidy up the current legislation <coughs> and better regulate crofting. So, as I said in my previous responses, the Crofting Bill Group was formally re established in May of last year and it's considering right now at least 50 different issues to determine which of these should feature in a bill that we bring forward. Uh, but of of course, there will be that wider engagement and consultation on this in due course, and I look forward to engaging with members across the chamber as we develop this legislation. Question three, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress of its proposed land reform bill. Cabinet Secretary. As set out in the programme for government, we are committed to introducing a land reform bill to further improve transparency of land ownership, help ensure large-scale land holdings deliver in the public interest and empower communities by providing more opportunities to own land and have more say in how land in their area is used. And the bill will also include measures to modernise agricultural holdings. Alistair. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My constituents on the island of Great Bernera have been fighting for a number of years to buy their land from an uncooperative and entirely absent landowner who often leaves correspondence uh, unanswered for months on end or ignores it altogether. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline whether there will be any provisions in the upcoming bill to prevent absentee landowners uh, from delaying matters in this way? Cabinet Secretary. I'm aware of the issues that Alistair Allen raises in his question and I'm also aware that he's supported his constituents uh, for a number of years and indeed has led uh, a member's debate on this, uh, on this issue and on the community group situation. So I absolutely understand and appreciate the frustration that I know both he and the people on Great Bernard must feel at the situation that they find themselves in. I know that while Scotland, in Scotland, of course, we do have landowners who are focused on making a positive impact on their local communities and they work with them to do that. Of course, that's not universal. And I accept that there is more that the government can do in this area, which is why our land reform bill proposals will seek to strengthen the obligations on landowners to comply with the land rights and responsibilities statement, as well as looking to introduce compulsory land management plans. Briefly, Mercedes Vialba. Trump International Golf Links in Aberdeenshire has long faced opposition from local residents concerned about the social and environmental impact of the development. Under the government's current land reform proposals, a 560 hectare holding like Trump International would not be considered large and so would not be subject to a public interest test. Does the minister agree that land of this size should be accountable to local communities and the wider public? Cabinet Secretary. 
I know that the member is looking to bring forward proposals in relation to this and that the consultation for Mercedes v Alba's draft members bill is just closed and of course I look forward to fully considering, uh, considering that and the detail of her proposals. However, we are not proposing a, a cap on land ownership because we are not persuaded that a cap is supported by the adequate evidence and a cap is unlikely to be compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights as well. So these are the really vital considerations that we, we have to uh, take cognizance of. So instead, that's why our proposals seek to ultimately empower communities by providing more opportunities to own land by receiving that prior notification of impending sales or transfers, as well as having more say in how land in their area is used. And our proposals will, of course, be fully compliant with ECHR and the terms of the devolved settlement too. Thank you. Question four was withdrawn. Question five, Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the greater use of farm-to-fork methods to encourage domestic food production. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is, of course, hugely supportive of greater use of farm-to-fork methods, both to encourage domestic food production and consumption. As an example of that, £490,000 worth of funding is being provided through the Food for Life programme over the course of this financial year, so that we have more locally sourced, healthier food in schools, as well as funding a global Glasgow-based pilot on expanding the principles of the Food for Life programme into the wider public sector. And I think it's, of course, important and uh, fantastic to be able to talk about some of these issues, uh, as well as the debate that we had yesterday, and to discuss food and drink in Scotland, to really celebrate our superb natural larder during the current food and drink fortnight. Megan Gallagher. I do agree that this is an important issue. So, given that the European Commission has softened its approach to gene editing technology over the summer, will the Cabinet Secretary not recognise, as the Scottish Conservatives do, that gene editing technology provides the best security for domestic uh, food production in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I know, based on the debate that we had about this in Food and Drink yesterday, just in the Chamber, the Tories seem to think that gene editing solves all the problems uh, in relation to, to food production and food security going forward. However, the Scottish Government, we're not in a rush to legislate in these issues, as the UK Government was, just to prove a point of difference. And we have to fully consider all the factors in relation to this. Now, that means having that discussion with our farmers, with scientists, and importantly, with our consumers as well, before we decide how to move forward. And of course, we will be looking at what's happening in the EU as that goes forward too. But unlike the UK Government, we like to take the time to consider these proposals fully and understand what the implications would be for Scotland. And very briefly, Karen, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Given the free trade agreements which threaten to harm domestic production and flood our market with imported goods of lesser quality, I find the question quite ironic. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that given the Scottish Government's commitment to active farming and food production, the best thing the Tories could do to help ensure domestic food production is lobby their colleagues in the UK Government about funding clarity for the agricultural sector post-2025. As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely, because right now we have absolutely no clarity on any long-term long funding and what that's going to look like beyond 2025. And currently, the Treasury has only provided yearly allocations with no commitment beyond that. And we need to know, whoever is in power at Westminster, how much funding we're going to have to support farming as well as other rural priorities. So I absolutely share the frustration that's been expressed by our farmers and food producers over the lack of future, future budget clarity. We also need a fair funding settlement that's not going to be cut arbitrarily from year to year by Westminster and to be able to create that multi-annual framework. And we would, of course, get all of that if Scotland was independent and back in the EU. Question six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what preparations it has made in response to the protracted start to the 2023 green harvest. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government supports farmers in preparing for, responding and adapting to challenging conditions over the course of the season by ensuring that timely and effective advice and support is available to inform decision making. Now, this includes the SRUC Crop Protection Report, which offers online, free of charge, regular analysis by region of current issues for a range of crops. And that includes fortnightly local reports on the progress of the grain harvest over the season, which aids farmers in making informed decisions for their crops. And it also also includes the Farm Advisory Service, which facilitates access to largely free, high-quality, generic and bespoke advice for the agricultural sector. Liz Smith. 
Okay, the Cabinet Secretary will know, however, that that information is showing that it has not been an easy start to the 2023 grain harvest, not just because of the delays, but because of poor quality in some uh, crops. And that's particularly true of barley in my area, which is causing concern not to farmers, but to the Scotch whisky industry. So in light of the fact that we don't have any clarity about the agricultural bill, can the Cabinet Secretary reassure these grain farmers that they will be supported? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I wouldn't agree with the, the member's statement that there is no clarity on the agricultural bill. As we have previously committed to, and I still maintain that commitment, we will be introducing an agriculture bill this year where we will continue to support our farmers and crofters as we have done in the past. We will continue to support our food producers with direct payments, again a commitment we have previously made and that I stand by. And briefly, Finlay Carson. Uh, over decades, precision crop breeding has led to modern varieties of cereal crops delivering higher yields and more resistant to a wide range of environmental stresses. However, the time needed for development of these new varieties uh, takes time. Um, with clear signs that the EU will change its position on gene editing, when will the Scottish Government commit to a policy which will allow our world-leading world institutions like the Hutton to adopt GE as a crop breeding tool, bringing huge benefits to our farming communities? Can you set out the timescales for that discussion to take place? Cabinet Secretary. Again, we fully support innovation when it comes to our agricultural sector and as Finlay Carson is aware, he named some of the institutes there, that we have world-leading institutes doing world-leading work uh, and science in that area too. I have outlined in a previous response on gene editing where we stand with that at the moment. Of course, we are carefully considering what happens elsewhere in the EU, but we have also got to understand the wider ramifications and fully consider that before taking any steps forward, whether that could affect future trade and again making sure we're engaging everyone in that conversation when uh, when we do that question seven ben mcpherson to ask the scottish government whether it will provide an update on its consideration of the scottish land commission's work on compulsory sale orders and land value capture cabinet secretary the programme for government published last week reiterates our commitment to consider the justification for and practical operation of compulsory sales orders and implement new infrastructure levy regulations by spring 2026. Now, that levy would provide local authorities with an additional mechanism for securing developer contributions alongside planning obligations. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and, and welcome the commitment in the programme for government and that progress. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the housing crisis we have here in Edinburgh and part of that is due to the extremely high cost of land. Therefore, I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary to continue to work with her government colleagues, whether that is on the uh, vacant and derelict land fund and the housing minister and to continue to engage with City of Edinburgh Council and parliamentarians here in the capital to work together to unlock as much of the uh, unused land and to reduce the price of land here in the capital. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member raises some really important points within his question there. Um, I would just want to outline that since 2021, Edinburgh City Council have received three awards from the Low Carbon, Vacant and Derelict Land Investment Programme, totalling just under £2.5 million to support that affordable housing and public realm in Granton and Green Dykes. And the Low Carbon, Vacant and Derelict Land Investment Programme really tries to support those local and those ambitious proposals to tackle that persistent vacant and derelict land and supporting place-based regeneration and the 20-minute neighbourhood aspirations as part of our just transition to net zero. But of course, together with my, uh, my government colleagues, we'll be happy to engage with him, with other members uh, representing the city region as well as the council too, to see how we can take forward and take action on these issues. Briefly, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Land value capture and compulsory sales are obviously complex issues. Any policy in this area will have to be both detailed and flexible to recognise the vast range of circumstances where such powers might be considered. If the Scottish Government do take this forward, can the Minister assure us that such compulsory sales will be a last resort and that the sale will only be permitted to buyers with a fully developed and funded plan for land use? I thank the member for that question. We're obviously not at the stage yet of taking those kind of decisions because, as the member rightly touches on, this is a really complex area, which is why we need to undertake the work on it and why we set that out in our programme for government. I'm aware that I have a, me a meeting upcoming with the member too, but I'd be happy to discuss these issues and how we intend to take them forward. Briefly, Rachel Hamilton. 
company officer, 17 per cent of Scotland's population is made up of people living in rural areas. Yet last week, the First Minister announced that he will be allocating just 10 per cent of new funding for building affordable homes to rural areas. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that this is an outrageous disparity? And will they push uh, back on his plan to underfund rural housing? Cabinet Secretary. It's this government that is committed to building more houses than any previous government before us or any government uh, anywhere else uh, uh, across these aisles. And I think that, but I do recognise that the member raises an important point about availability of housing. And I think when I travel to rural parts, uh, other rural parts of Scotland, to our islands, housing is a key issue that's mentioned there and the need for more housing. But that's why the Housing Minister has been working on developing a remote rural and islands housing action plan, which will be coming forward to look at how we can address and tackle these issues, uh, whether working with, uh, with the third sector, working with other enterprises, with, with business, because the good work is happening right across the country at the moment, but it's how we really focus on that and drive that house building forward. Question 8, Graham Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what cross-government consideration there has been regarding the use of tunnels to improve connectivity between the islands. Minister Fiona Hislop. Transport Scotland regularly engaged with colleagues across the Scottish Government in the islands, planning, housing, population and infrastructure teams in the context of improving transport connectivity to and from Scotland's many islands. I recently visited Shetland, Orkney and Mull, during which I had several discussions on the matter of tunnels and fixed links, replacing existing ferry services. While transport is a devolved matter, I have just this week had a discussion on the replacement of the Fair Isle Ferry with the UK Minister Richard Holden MP. These discussions did not extend to fixed links to our islands. Graham Simpson. I okay, thank the Minister for that answer. In July, Shetland Council wrote to the Secretary of State for Scotland and the First Minister asking to meet about tunnels and other matters. A date has been arranged for the Council leader to meet Alistair Jack in London. Has the First Minister responded? And if not, why not? Minister. So I was very pleased to meet with Shetland uh, Island Council myself uh, in August and discussed these matters. As far as the First Minister is aware, my understanding is that in September, uh, Shetland Island Council themselves uh, committed to spend £700,000 considering the business case for four potential new fixed links within the Shetlands. They have direct responsibility. But in, in terms of the invitation to the First Minister, I understand it was um, later in September. I may be wrong about that. I'm not responsible for his diary, but I understand that an invitation is being actively considered, and I'm sure there'll be a response, as you might expect, in due course. And Beatrice Wishart. With the growing space, salmon and renewable energy sectors in Shetland and the reported growing interest of the UK Government in meeting with Shetland Islands Council about short subsea tunnels, will the Scottish Government commit a date to meet with Shetland Islands Council specifically to discuss tunnels? Minister. Uh, can I say that, uh, and first of all, can I thank the, the, the member for hosting my meeting with Yale and Unst? Uh, tunnel Action Group when I visited. Uh, at that same time in Shetland, I also met with Shetland Island Council and with Thestrans and the issue of fixed links, uh, precisely because of the, the reasons that were set out, the growing economic links were part of that agenda item back in August. So those discussions will continue. I've also indicated to the, the members that I met in Shetland that Transport Scotland stand ready to help and assist with any of the business cases that they are currently putting together. Thank you, Minister. That concludes uh, portfolio questions on rural affairs, land reform and islands. I'll allow a brief pause to allow the front benches to change. The next item of business is portfolio questions on NHS recovery, health and social care. I can advise the Chamber that uh, questions 6 and 8 have been grouped together and therefore supplementaries on those questions will be taken after both the questions have been asked and answered. As ever, I'd invite anybody uh, looking to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. And I call question number 1, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. 
to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the First Minister's commitment in the programme for Government 2023-24, to publish a new delivery plan for mental health and wellbeing, what it is doing to improve pathways to diagnosis for neurodivergent children. Minister Marie Todd. Um, following publication of the Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy in June 2023, we will publish a delivery plan later this autumn which will set out the steps that we will take to improve support for children with neurodevelopmental support needs. As set out in the strategy, we are committed to working in partnership to strengthen support and, to, and care part, pathways for people who are requiring neurodevelopmental support. To do this, we will build on work to implement the neurodevelopmental specification for children and young people, including five tests of change across Scotland, working closely with partners to share learning and to improve services and support. Karen Adam. I thank the Minister for that answer. With um, personal experience and constituent feedback highlighting often gatekeeping at what should be access points onto a diagnostic pathway, how is the Scottish Government ensuring unimpeded access and support for neurodivergent individuals at key points such as education and community health so they can uphold their dignity and prevent additional mental health issues? Minister. So it's important for me to say in response, a diagnosis is not required for children and young people to receive support. The neurodevelopmental specification makes clear that support should be in place to meet the child or young person's requirements when they need it at the earliest opportunity rather than being dependent on a formal diagnosis. For many children and young people, such support is likely to be community-based and should be quickly and easily accessible. We're going to continue to work with key partners from local authorities, education and health to implement the neurodevelopmental specification right across Scotland. Supplementary, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, the lower unit in Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital provided a daycare and outpatient support to children and young people with autism spectrum disorders. But it closed almost a decade ago. Families in the Northeast are crying out for dedicated post-diagnostic support like the Lowett Unit. What action is the Scottish Government taking with health boards and local authorities to ensure this support is in place? Thank Min you. Minister. So the member will be aware that when we're approaching this issue, we use, we intend, aim to support um, children and families um, to access support um, and services that meet their needs using the getting it right for every child approach, the GERFEC approach. So for many children and young people, such support is likely to be community-based and it should be very quickly and easily accessible. There are a number of different models around the country. As I said, we're exploring four tests of five tests of change around the country. Um, at the end of this at the end of October, I think it is, we are coming together to share the learning from those um, tests of change and to make sure that we can implement and roll out those tests of change all over the country. Question two, Sue Webber. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the number of alcohol-specific deaths in 2022. Mr Eleanor Whitham. In Parliament on the September the 7th, I outlined the Government's plan to reduce alcohol harms and deaths in response to the alcohol-specific deaths in 2022 and committed to a debate um, to the plan in more detail. It includes evaluating minimum unit pricing and alcohol marketing consultation responses, and we will publish the recommendations of Public Health Scotland's review on alcohol brief interventions and ask Public Health Scotland to investigate reductions in referral numbers to services. Approximately £113 million is available to support initiatives responding to local needs underpinned by the forthcoming treatment standards and workforce action plan to improve quality and capacity. Sue Webber. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, in April it was revealed to me via a written question from yourself that the Scottish Government had cut alcohol and drug recovery services by £19 million in 2022-23. Now that we've seen a 14-year high in alcohol deaths and Scotland remains the drug death capital of Europe, presiding officer, does the minister accept that these cuts have had a devastating effect on people suffering with drug and alcohol misuse? And will the minister commit to restoring funding to these services in 2023-24? Minister. 
I think it's really important to point out that in my response to um, the question that the member raised, we actually outlined that there had been no reduction in the funding that was being made available to alcohol and drug partnerships. Indeed, the funding being made available to them had increased year on year. Last year, um, we had £106.8 million available um, to alcohol and drug partnerships. This year, we have £113 million available to those same partnerships. What we asked those partnerships to do was make sure that they used their reserves appropriately and then drew down on the funding. But that funding has then been moved forward and, and used in other ways within um, alcohol and drug partnerships themselves. So there has been no overall reduction in funding. But I will bring back to the, the Chamber um, a debate where we actually will discuss a cohesive plan because I do recognise that members across the Chamber are looking to understand what the government is doing to tackle alcohol-specific deaths and alcohol harm. So I will do that. Brief supplementary bill, Kate. Thank you very much, President Officer. The Scottish Government's world-leading minim minimum unit pricing policy has been shown to have a welcome impact on tackling alcohol-related harm. Uh, can the Minister provide any update as to ongoing work to review the price level? Minister. Work on reviewing the level of minimum unit pricing is underway as the impact of, of MUP is connected to the unit price. It is important that we have a robust evidence base to support any decision on the change of the level of MUP. And as outlined in the programme for government, we will publish our final report on the operation and the effect of MUP in the Scottish Parliament later this month, alongside a consultation on its future, both in terms of price and the continuation of the scheme. Thank you. Question three was not lodged. Question four, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with NHS Fife and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, ministers and the Scottish Government official, uh, officials, officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Fife, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Annabel, you. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for his answer. One current NHS Fife issue, of course, concerns the new medical centre for Loch Ely. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise, further to his most welcome visit last week, whether he recognises that Loch Gelly has waited an awful long time and that its new medical centre deserves to be treated as a priority? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to Annabelle Ewing for her question and also for her invitation to visit the health centre in Loch Gelly. Uh, last week, and I want to put on record my thanks to those within the local community and the staff within the local, uh, within the health centre, for the time and uh, engagement I had with them during uh, my visit. Uh, there is no doubt, in my view, that the health centre needs to be replaced. As I outlined to um, Annabel Ewing and the local community, the health uh, centre was not within the infrastructure investment plan for 2021-2026. Uh, and of course, alongside that, we're having to undertake a review of our capital expenditure due to a cut in our capital budget by the UK government and also the impact of construction inflation, which has pushed up the cost of existing projects very significantly. But I can assure the member that we'll continue to look at what can be done, uh, because I do recognise the need for the health centre in Lochelle to be replaced. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Uh, I was alarmed over the summer that NHS Fife reported a £7.9 million revenue overspend only two months into the fiscal year. I would be concerned if attempts to bring this overspend back under control resulted in the loss of staffing, especially when the waiting lists are just enormous. So what steps is the government taking to protect services in Fife? Cabinet Secretary. Well, for example, one of the actions we're taking to protect and improve services in Fife is the construction of a new national treatment centre. Uh, that is delivering additional capacity to the Kingdom of Fife and for patients in that area, which is a significant investment uh, that will improve services going forward. So I can assure the member that where we have boards that are projecting um, uh, overspends going forward, that we provide them with tailored support and engage with them to try to manage uh, the financial pressures which they're facing. But I hope the member would also recognise by the creation of the NTC in Fife, it's a clear demonstration of this government's commitment to improving services in Fife. Thank you. Question five from Jackie Bailey, who joins us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to urgently address the reported maintenance backlog in GP practices. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, over the next four years, we will invest £73 billion in health and care services and a further £1.3 billion in capital funding, doubling our investment in maintenance and equipment replacement to support their recovery, sustainability and reform. 
This is in addition to the annual primary medical services allocation, which includes £68 million of, for the provision of maintenance of GP practice estate. The Scottish Government will continue to work with Bowles to address financial pressures across the system. Jackie Bailey. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. He will know that the current maintenance backlog in GP surgeries actually stands at 78.5 million, which is already over the budget he set out. He knows there's a shortage of GPs, primary care budgets have been cut, and only 5% of doctors in a recent BMA survey thought their practice was sustainable. So with services already stretched, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what more he can do to set aside capital funding over the next three years to repair GP practices? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I'm not entirely sure that the figure that Jackie Bailey quotes is the correct figure because within the data which he's using, I suspect there actually is a range of additional costs in that which are about lifetime uh, recurring costs which are normal for uh, capital projects. But as I've already outlined, we're in a situation where the Scottish Government's capital budget has been cut by the UK Government, uh, which has a direct impact on how much we can invest in our capital estate. Alongside that, we're also having to deal with what is a very significant increase in capital uh, project costs as a result of construction inflation. So we'll continue to do everything we can to invest in capital projects, but there are significant challenges which the capital review is presently taken forward by the DFM in order to look at what further action we'll have to take to address the financial pressures we're facing in our capital budgets. Question six, Sandy Skolhani. Remind members of my register of interest as a practicing NHS GP to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported plans by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to reduce the number of community link workers embedded in GP practices in deprived areas of Glasgow by one third due to Scottish Government funding cuts. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, I'm very concerned about the risk to link workers in Glasgow from April 2024 as they provide a vital service in disadvantaged areas. My officials are engaging with the Health and Social Care Partnership on its plans for primary care in 2024-25 and exploring all options to avoid a reduction in posts. Sandy Skolhani. I've received several letters from Deep End Practices and have met with one in Glasgow telling me how invaluable community link workers are. These cuts are a direct threat to the stability, stability of the practices themselves and the loss of community link workers will have a severe impact on the most vulnerable patients in our poorest communities. The SNP made a manifesto commitment to increase community link workers in GP surgeries and promised investment in practices in disadvantaged areas. Why are we seeing the opposite and will the Scottish Government ensure that these cuts are reversed? Cabinet Secretary. So, an officer, um, unfortunately, um, Ms Ogohani is actually incorrect. These are not a result of uh, Scottish Government budget cuts because the funding for community link workers comes from the Primary Care Improvement Fund. Uh, that fund still stands at £190 million. Uh, the issue that Glasgow's uh, uh, Health and Social Care Partnership have is that they have gone beyond the funding which was provided to them in the delivery of community link workers, which they are no longer able to sustain. He may be aware that we actually stepped in and provided an extra £1.3 million this year in order to protect posts in this financial year. And we're continuing to engage with the Health and Social Care Partnership to make sure that we have a sustainable position to support what are invaluable workers working in some of the most challenging GP practices in the country. Question 8 from Paul Sweeney, who joins us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the 2021 SNP manifesto commitment to expand on the Community Link Worker Programme. Cabinet Secretary. Due to difficult decisions during the emergency budget review, recruitment of additional roles to support community mental health resilience and ensure every general practice has access to a dedicated mental health and wellbeing service was not commenced. However, we have already prioritised significant investment to build primary care mental health capacity through Action 15 and the Primary Care Improvement Fund. Over 540 whole-time equivalent primary care mental health workers have been recruited through these. We remain committed to improving mental health service provision in primary care settings. Paul Sweeney. As Dr Glahani mentioned, the proposed reduction in community link worker posts in Glasgow will be felt most acutely by deprived communities in the city. And last week's programme for government committed to ensuring that services like the link worker programme can respond to local needs 
in the year ahead. But link workers and GP practices are facing uncertainty in the here. Now, it's not good enough for the Cabinet Secretary to simply pass the buck. So will the Cabinet Secretary commit to getting around the table with the Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership and the GMB Trade Union to ensure that link worker provision is maintained at its current level and can be funded more sustainably in the longer term? Cabinet Secretary. I'm saying, officer, as already mentioned in response to Mr Gohani's uh, question, we're already engaging with the Health and Social Care Partnership in uh, Glasgow to understand their plans going forward for the Primary Care Improvement Fund and will continue to engage with them in order to try to address the issues which they face with community link workers. I recognise the important value which they have and we want to make sure that they are maintained in order to support GP practices in some of our most deprived communities. Supplementary, Ivan McKee. This week I met with GPs in Easterhouse in my Glasgow Province constituency who expressed deep concern at proposed reductions to the hugely valuable community link worker programme. They highlighted reductions in GP workload and in prescriptions issued as a consequence of the work undertaken by the links workers. They also highlighted a carbon cost as prescriptions are one of the health services biggest carbon footprints. These reductions are a false economy at a time when we should be moving towards preventative medicine. Has the Scottish Government done any assessment of the additional costs in terms of GP time or additional prescriptions and indeed our carbon footprint that would arise from these proposals? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, we haven't carried out such an assessment on uh, general practices or the wider system. However, we recognise the important value that community link workers have as part of the multidisciplinary team within primary uh, care settings, which is why uh, we take the issues which are uh, being highlighted by uh, members around the potential impact on community link workers in Glasgow very seriously, and why we've already started a process of engagement with the Health and Social Care Partnership in Glasgow to understand how they plan to use uh, the investment we are providing them with around the Primary Care Improvement Fund. But I would also underline the point that we have already stepped in to provide financial support to the Health and Social Care Partnership to allow them to continue at these posts within this financial year. And it's important that as a partnership they have a sustainable financial pathway to supporting these posts. And question seven, Carol Mochan. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to invest in community midwifery services to ensure that they are consistently delivered in areas of need rather than in centralised and often hard to access locations. Minister Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We remain committed to ensuring that maternity services continue to be developed in a flexible and innovative way, recognising local population needs and geographic challenges. Over the last five years, Scottish Government has invested over £25 million to support implementation of the Best Start programme, which includes recommendations for con continuity of carer and the delivery of community hubs. We also published the Continuity of Carer and Local Delivery of Care Implementation Framework, which is designed to assist NHS board implementation. This will be based on local needs assessment, viability and scope of potential impact hubs. Community midwives also deliver care in women's homes as necessary. Carol Mochan. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that answer. I have met with midwives across South Scotland region and what is clear to me is that there is now significant pressure on midwifery professionals' ability to deliver regular high-quality community-based services to those most in need. It is the Government's lack of a proper education and workforce strategy for midwives and the Government's inability to support rural health boards with high numbers of vacancies that is contributing to these pressures. Will they accept that back and set out in full the action they can take which will ensure midwives are supported to provide community-based services in areas most in need? Minister. I thank the member for that question. Um, a couple of uh, weeks ago, I met with uh, a number of midwives from across Scotland um, at their uh, conference, and it was heartening to hear the um, progress that the best start uh, uh, programme has, has, has created within midwifery. We've also got um, the National Midwifery's Task Force, again, which we work closely with. And I know that the member has written to me on other subjects, and I'm happy to meet with that, and perhaps we can cover this in that meeting as well. And supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Continuity of carer was a key recommendation of the Scottish Government's Best Start Plan to reshape paternity and neonatal services with a vision of relationship-based continuity of carer tailored to the individual's needs and delivered as close to home as possible. Can the Minister provide any updates as to the Scottish Government's work to progress this recommendation? 
And Minister. Thank you. All boards continue to work towards implementation of continuity of carer following a pause during COVID-19. We have reconvened the Best Start Leads Group and have held learning events and deep dive sessions to support boards with the implementation of continuity of carer, the most recent being on the 30th of August. In addition, we've written out to boards asking them to continue to prioritise rollout of continuity with a particular focus on socially complex women and families and women with poorer maternity outcomes and boards will report back to us on how they are progressing with that work. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on NHS recovery, health and social care. There will be a brief pause to allow front benches to change before we move on to the next item of business.